everything that could go wrong has gone wrong. And we need to talk about it because the learnings don't just apply to this case, but apply to other aspects of health as well. The results from the Keto CTA trial were just released, and that's what we'll be going through in this video. This was a trial of what the authors term lean mass hyperresponders. So these are people defined as a triad of elevated LDL cholesterol along with elevated HDL cholesterol and low triglycerides that tends to occur in lean, generally healthy individuals adopting a low carbohydrate diet. But as the authors say, irrespective of the metabolic and mechanistic drivers of this lean mass hyperresponder phenotype, there is understandable clinical concern, especially among those lean mass hyperresponders with the most extreme profiles, including LDL cholesterol levels of an excess of 500 milligrams per deciliter. So if I saw a patient in the clinic with that high a level of LDL cholesterol, I would be incredibly concerned, and here's why. All of the cardiology guidelines, all of the medical schools, all of the hospitals, they all advocate for lower LDL cholesterol levels to lower a heart disease risk. And those guidelines are based on papers such as this one. So this one was published in the European Heart Journal uh, in 2017. And it was looking at the link between LDL cholesterol and heart disease. So this study combined over 200 prospective cohort studies, randomized controlled trials. It involved over 2 million participants with over 20 million person years of follow-up. And what they found is a remarkably consistent dose to log linear association between the absolute magnitude of exposure of LDL cholesterol and heart disease. And it's easier to see on the graph here, basically every single line of evidence that we have seems to indicate, again, when we combine it together, that the more LDL cholesterol that our blood vessels are exposed to, the higher our risk of heart disease. This is why in the clinic I work hard with my patients to lower their LDL cholesterol and APOB levels. I want to prevent disease rather than treat it. So coming back to the Keto CTA study, the authors wanted to look at these people that had very high levels of LDL cholesterol and who met their phenotype of being a lean mass hyperresponder. So they followed 100 people up, again with this triad, uh, over a one-year period and they were looking at plaque buildup in the blood vessels. And before any human study is done, it needs to be pre-registered on a clinical trial registry such as this one on the page. And basically, this just means that there's nowhere to hide. You're outlying what you're going to be measuring and roughly what you're going to be doing. And so you need to publish these results. And you you have to select a primary outcome, as in what is the one thing that you're trying to measure to prove or disprove your hypothesis. So for the study, they were using the percentage change in non-calcified coronary plaque volume. That's critical because when we're going through the results of the Keto CTA study, we need to know what the primary outcome is. So we're looking at the results section now. But when we go through the study, we don't see the raw data. All we see is this graph here. So you have to pixel peep. You have to try and figure out, based on this trend line, how much has the non-calcified plaque progressed? So we, we don't know. And that's a massive red flag. Every single study should be publishing their primary outcome in written form, along with the statistical analysis. So we can actually see for ourselves what is going on. Have we proven or disproven the hypothesis? So again, all we're given here is an image. So how much has the non-calcified plaque progressed? And is that rate of progression concerning? So we, we don't know. But the authors in their previous research, they gave an estimate as to how much they thought the plaque was going to progress over that one-year time frame. So they say they gave a conservative estimate of mean plaque volume change of seven units, given that the subjects are substantially younger with little to no risk factors. So that's really important. Before the study began, the primary outcome, as in the thing that they were going to hang their hat on in terms of their hypothesis, was the change in non-calcified plaque volume. And they were expecting that to be roughly seven units over the one-year time frame. And it was only after massive pressure on social media that the authors finally gave us this result in written form. And it was 18.8 units. So that's a lot more than what was expected. And they posted it alongside a meme for some reason. All of this is incredibly concerning. The fact that the plaque progressed a lot more compared to what the authors were anticipating and they didn't report it correctly. These are massive red flags. But how does that 18.8 number compare to other results? So if we have a look at the Paradigm study, so this is where they measure the change in atheroma for high-risk individuals, and this was over a 10-year period, so they could roughly see how much was the percentage change for each year, and if we overlay the Keto CTA results, it, it's, it's damning. The people who participated in the Keto CTA study, their plaque progressed a lot more compared to even high-risk individuals from other studies. To drive this point home, there are separate cohort studies that we can have a look at. So a non-diabetic cohort progressed their plaque by 2.8 units over a one-year period. A diabetic cohort progressed by 34.3 units. So the keto CTA results are roughly in between that. So again, none of this is painting a good picture. 
the rate of progression of non-calcified plaque for these individuals in the keto CTA study is incredibly concerning. The fact that it wasn't reported correctly is incredibly concerning. And then the coverage on social media by these authors, again, is incredibly concerning. Because online, the discussion about the study from these authors has generally been to say that there's no correlation between blood cholesterol levels and plaque, and people are believing this. When this is the reality of the situation that's summed up perfectly by this meme. So we want to ignore that lean mass hyperresponders have rapid plaque progression. Instead, we're going to focus on lean mass hyperresponders have only rapid plaque progression with no difference between very high and extremely high LDL cholesterol levels. This is completely missing the point, and I'm getting concerned because I see people in the clinic who have got very high levels of LDL cholesterol and they don't want to address that because of what they see online. Every time that I post something on social media, to be honest, it terrifies me that I've got something wrong. I have to double check and triple check everything and make sure that I'm following the clinical guidelines because I know the potential damage that I can inflict on the population if I'm telling people something that's wrong. And I, again, see this in the clinic where people are under the impression that if they're on a keto diet or they're a so-called lean mass hyperresponder, if they have high LDL cholesterol levels, that they don't necessarily need to worry about it because of some of the research and commentary around studies like this. And I have to spend a lot of time going through the research with these uh, with these patients. And oftentimes, I don't manage to make much headway because they've been following these influences for a lot longer compared to the, a 15-minute consultation that I've got as a primary care doctor with the patient sitting in front of me. And apologies if I'm getting a bit worked up, but I, I see the consequences of this, again, in my clinic, where people are having heart attacks and strokes that could have been prevented if we managed to control all of their cardiovascular risk factors, including their LDL levels and APOB levels.